Hello, I'm Denny Somak, and this is The Rock Podcast. Now, I'm a rock historian, producer, and best-selling author, and I've been collecting thousands of interviews over the years. I try and present great stories from my archives, and we also have newly recorded interviews. What we have on this episode, a brand new conversation with Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull. I have interviewed Ian a few times over the years and probably seen him live over a dozen times. He's a great interview and very opinionated in a good way. The band has just released their 23rd album titled Rook Flutia. Well, something like that. I'm going to let Ian explain it to you. We cover a lot of ground and it was a really enjoyable chat. So here is Jethro Tull founder, Ian Anderson. I recognize your name. Yeah. Okay, off we go. Okay. So I got to ask you this first before we talk about the new album, and I'm sure you've been asked it before, but I, I, I don't think I ever asked it. What characterizes a Jethro Tull album and an Ian Anderson solo album? How do you make that decision? Well, it depends who's playing on the record. If it's the members of Jethro Tull, then um, most of the time it would be a Jethro Tull album. But if it's a a project that is more personal, or it may be an acoustic album or an orchestral album, then I guess more likely it would be a an Ian Anderson album. The same thing with tours. You know, if I'm going out on tour and we're playing the repertoire that was recorded as Jethro Tull, then it's a Jethro Tull tour. But if I was doing a tour or a concert that was, you know, largely comprised of solo album material, then it would be an Ian Anderson tour. So it really just has to do with who is playing and what the material is. Well, this is uh, this started out as a lot of instrumentals on this. Did it start out as an Ian Anderson album or was it always a Jethro? Tour? No, no, no. It was never going to be an instrumental album. It was an album that was, uh, I spoke to the record company just before Christmas in 2000 and. 21 and said that the album would be a an album of rock music heavily featuring the flute mm. but not necessarily as an instrumental album and so the working title was rock flute but right. on the first day of of uh, beginning the project on the 1st of January in 2022 having looked at a few options i decided that it would be an album looking at the polytheistic beliefs of of Norse mythology. And the album became Rook, meaning in old Icelandic, the word destiny, and Flöte being in German, the pronunciation and spelling of the, the flute, the instrument I play. Do you have a... Uh... An interest, um, a fascination with Norse mythology? Not at all, no. I have a fascination with comparative religions, which I've been interested in since I was a schoolboy. You know that. And uh, read widely on a number of religions, but rather steered clear of Norse mythology because of its unfortunate associations with, you know, on the milder side of things, heavy metal bands who like to... Um, identify with the macho Nordic Viking kind of a, a, a not so much history, but just a just a fascination and an identification with the the manliness of it all, as right. they see it. But also, what put me off was the the connections with the um, well, particularly Heinrich Himmler's fascination with the Nordic ideal, as he saw it, of Aryan supremacy. And mm -hmm. and so um, it's something I rather steer clear of. And having looked on day one of working on the new album, I looked at uh, Greek mythology, I looked at Roman mythology, and settled on the, on the Nordic mythology only because it was a subject that I, A, didn't know that much about, and B, was rather reticent to get involved with but i thought well rather than see that as a um as a negative i should try and find a way to do it in a sensitive manner that would look at the traditions the characters 
and the roles of those um, Norse gods and relate those to human personalities and characters in the world that I know today. So that's what I decided to do. But, you know, this, the, 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 the best, the best, the best things you can do in life are not necessarily the easy options. Sometimes it's a good thing to tackle something that right. that you're not familiar with and maybe puts you off a little bit. It's, 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 uh, that's more of a challenge. Okay. Now, in the uh, song Hammer on Hammer, of course, you, you talk about Vlad the Bad. I assume that's Vladimir Putin, or am I wrong? No, no, Vladimir Vladimirovich himself, and he's... Uh, uh, was part of a meet and greet that I did in 1992 after the White Nights Festival in St. Petersburg when he was the chief advisor to Anatoly Sobchak, the then mayor of St. Petersburg. And at that time, Putin was a, a part-time major in the KGB, and um, I don't think he was particularly happy about me chatting to his boss. Mm. Um, Putin was already, I think at that point, probably involved in local corruption, certainly in his hatred of the West and his fascination with the um, the traditions of of what was had recently been the USSR. Yeah. And that has continued in, in an amplified way to to really inform his life since then. He's he's a man with a either paranoid de delusion, which would be the preferable thing, or he's a very clever, canny, nasty piece of work who is, knows exactly what he's doing and is out there to try and, in his final days, to try and rebuild planet Earth in the in the shape that he sees that it should be, which is to, is to reconstitute the Russian Empire. And he's filled with hatred and, uh, and vitriol. Uh, there was a time maybe 15 years ago when I thought Putin, with his obvious skills as an international statesman and politician, could possibly change his ways and leave a, a valuable legacy. But that has long since gone as a, an option. He is now going to be remembered alongside some of the worst people yeah. in history in terms of his uh, both his corruption, his... Uh, his uh, willingness to subjugate his own people as well as to try and um, distort, manage, and ultimately obtain the things that he desperately wants, which is uh, all the all the countries who were lost mm -hmm. in the former USSR, forming Glasnost and Perestroika, and the the uh, the passing of. Um, um of uh, Gorbachev in the in the in that era. I mean it was Yeltsin who appointed Putin to be the man. Mm -hmm. Putin was a relatively harmless drunk, but um he uh, he gave the job to a, a venomous snake. Mm. So I and know if, if that... Roger Waters has a problem with what I've just said, yeah. meet me outside, Roger. Take your specs off. I'm going, to send, to I'm going to send it to him. Yeah, you do. You're, you're one of the most respected commentators on politics. And I was going to ask you what you think about that, but I, I, I think you answered your... Uh, well, I, I think there are people who in a naive sort of way want to become apologists and also in an equally naive way want to vilify others. I, I understand yeah. Roger w w Waters' position. He's saying... He's saying things where there is a grain of truth behind it but in his desire to shoot his mouth off he, he's really gone too far and and uh, you know his his views on israel right. he should understand that if you say those things they're going to be interpreted as an attack not on israel and the likud they're going to be perceived as an attack on the jewish world they're right. going to be perceived as anti-semitic and, and I don't think that that's what he means. I don't think that that's what he's trying to do for one minute. But he should understand that the world out there in in the tabloid media is just looking for an excuse to give you a hard time. And, you know, if you take things out of context, as has been the case with others who 
been a little bit uh, vociferous, I'm thinking of Morrissey, for example, then you should understand that when you say these things, there's a very grave likelihood that people will fasten on to it in the way that perhaps you didn't really intend. Mm. And and I know that, and even what I'm saying now, you know, someone might jump on some element of what I've said and decide to use that against me, but I, I try to have a balanced view. I have tried to have a view that is is about respect and tolerance and understanding. And I take a naturally the middle ground. I, I'm not someone who wants to get out there on a on a limb politically or socially or environmentally. I naturally seem to take the middle ground, but I do like to see things from both points of view. Therefore there's a little part of me would depend would defend Roger Waters, for example, but you know, he dug himself a hole and jumped right in it. <laughs> now, this sort of relates to the question I started at the top, but I want to get your answer because uh, you may recall there was a time when you admitted turning away from Jethro Tull and more or less wanted to be known as Ian Anderson, who played in a band called Jethro Tull. Do you remember saying that? Well, I've said lots of things along those lines. And one thing that I think is important that when I was asked on a few occasions, probably 10 years ago, you know, what are the plans for Jethro Tull? And I said, there are no plans. There are, there are no um, upcoming tours or albums projected as Jethro Tull. But that tended to be taken as um, as Jethro Tull was finished and over. Uh, ironically, because at that time, there were lots of Jethro Tull concerts still in the date sheet. But um, whenever I was playing Jethro Tull repertoire, then we would be we would be out there appearing as Jethro Tull, billed as Jethro Tull in, you know, in concerts around the world. But at that point, there were no plans for any new albums and there weren't any plans for any further tours mm -hmm. as Jethro Tull other than the ones that were already in the date sheet that perhaps were you know, been there for a year. Now, I know, yeah, I inevitably, know had... inevitably, those things change and you, you right. find yourself in a situation where if you have a project coming up that does embrace the same members of the band and, and that kind of material, then, then uh, you know, I never ruled out that Jethro Tell would not be uh, um, releasing albums as Jethro Tell or mm -hmm. conducting future tours as Jethro Tell. It just is at that particular point in time there was nothing in the uh, nothing in the future calendar along those lines okay now i i if i'm not uh, mistaken you had some dates to play ukraine i don't know if you had dates in russia too before the pandemic obviously they had to be canceled do you think you'll ever play either of those countries again well the actual dates in uh, in russia were scheduled for september last year Mm -hmm. And um, around February of last year, we had to sell, tell our Russian promoter, look, the way things are going, there's no possibility that we're going to be able to come to Russia. And indeed, over the next few weeks, things got markedly worse. Um, those dates have actually been cancelled. Okay. And I can't see any time, well, in my lifetime, I really can't imagine that we will be able to go to Russia to perform again. My lifetime being relatively short, as you can understand. Um, with Ukraine, the concerts were necessarily cancelled, but with the advisory that we would try to reinstate them whenever we could. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in Russia, for example, I'd already received the advance payment from the promoters, and I've been trying to give it back ever since then. But unfortunately, with the banking laws and the realities of trying to manage currency movements, it's impossible for us to, to repatriate that money directly to Russia in terms of where it came from, um, which is very embarrassing to me because people bought tickets, people, promoters paid over the advance. And, and I am humiliated by the fact that I've taken somebody's money and I haven't turned up for work. Right. But that's Russian fans. I try to divorce in my own mind the relationship between them as individuals and people and the uh, the policies and practice of Putin and his Kremlin hierarchy. So I don't I don't see that Russia will be on the cards because I don't think this will end anytime soon. 
um, with uh, Ukraine, I have subsequently made it known to the promoters that, you know, whenever you think it's time to uh, try and reconvene the concert in uh, in Kiev, then, you know, hell, we'll be there. Just let me know. But uh, their response was, we have so many, so many um, cancel concerts that we want to reschedule that it's not just one or two or 10, it's hundreds of shows. Yeah. And so trying to put all that back into place again is a mammoth job. Assuming, of course, that the venues still exist, that the promoters still exist, that the the um, the economics favor the selling of tickets. I mean, you know, if somebody will just cover the airfares. You know, I'm I'm happy to to be there, and you know, for no money at all. It's just it's just that you know, there's clearly a lot of costs involved in doing something like that and uh, putting on a show. And um, but yes, I of course I would like to go back to play in. In the Ukraine, I've been there a few times, just as I've been a few times in Russia. Right. Okay. What uh, what songs from the new album will be in the uh, the new show? Well, the day after tomorrow, the show. Uh, not the day. Uh, when is it? I'm playing in uh, days today, Monday, Thursday, Thursday. I will be in Reykjavik, and the, there'll be two songs from the new album, which will be the Navigators and Hammer on Hammer. Uh, along with a couple of songs from uh, the Zealot Gene, the album of mm -hmm. that was released in the previous year, and a bunch of stuff which is a mixture of songs going back. I, I'm trying to feature a song from each decade right. in which Jethro Tull has released records. Okay. Well, that leads you to my next question as to what songs from the catalog do you feel obligated to play? None at all. I don't feel obligated to do anything. And I guess at one time or another, there's been popular songs that have been left out of the set list for one reason or another. But um, there are songs that I think are particularly important to me as a as a as a writer and a performer that I guess are absolutely aligned with the the favourites of most of the audiences. Um, the 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 piece Buray from the instrumental piece from the Stand Up album uh, Aqualung Locomotive Breath and um, then there are a few others that are quite commonly found in the show songs like My God or Cross Eyed Mary and and um, and pieces along the way which I guess people would expect to hear and want to hear. And to some extent, you know, they, they feature in the set list, but, you know, you can't put them all in. You've got to be varied and and personal pride dictates that you do take the risk of performing music that is from your more, more recent work, even though you know that it's really an excuse for a toilet break for a lot of people who just want to hear the stuff they want to hear. But um, that's okay. I... I um, you know, we are, our audiences are quite often advanced in age and don't have the uh, bladder control that they used to, so they've got to take a toilet break sometime. Are you uh, are you surprised at how Aqualung has stood up after all these years? Did you know well, it's an al it's an album it's an album that is about people in a context. Uh, it's an album which is in part quite singer songwriter in in nature although there are a few heavy rock songs in it but they're they're songs about people and what they do they're, they're very rarely songs i think maybe one song on the album comes to mind that is a an i me sort of a song about how i feel essentially a love song but um most of the songs are, are more objective about human stereotypes human characters human personalities in a context they're not portraits and they're not landscapes. They are people in a landscape. The mm. people, almost as if on a theatrical stage, where you want to know more about them, and you give them a setting, you give them a context, you give them a right. um, an environment in which their descriptive 
nature in the lyrics will will have a context that makes it perhaps easier to understand who they are and why they are in the song. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I do. I'm I'm more of an objective writer. I'm not really a heart on sleeve writer for the most part. And um, happily, there are a few others like me who tend to write about stuff. Um, but the vast majority of lyric writers, past and present, write songs that are about how they feel. And um, whilst that might be a little bit of uh, fascination for people who, who who want to know how you feel, what makes you tick, what your feelings are about things, I, it's not something I feel moved to write. I'm I'm uh, a rather private person. I tend to be more objective in my writing. I think overall. Okay. Um, have you ever seen any of these Jethro Tull cover bands? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've even played with a couple of them and, you know, God bless them. They're just cheerful amateurs. They're not going out there onto the, the world stage trying to make a living out of imitating or copying me. Yeah. Um, but, um, generally speaking, tribute bands is not a phenomenon these days that I'm very approving of. I, I, I think it's a descent into the world of being a musical hooker once you try and make a living out of imitating and copying someone else. However much you might be infatuated with their music, there is a cynical <clears throat> reality that it's something that you, you know, it's a meal ticket. So whilst there are relatively harmless tribute bands who imitate and dress up as ABBA, those that, that, those that identify with more serious music, I don't have a lot of respect for, you know, the endless imitators of Pink Floyd um, and those who take on the gargantuan task, as it really is physically, of of uh, being a meatloaf tribute band or, a, um, you know, or in terms of musical expertise, those who try to do complicated and difficult music. It's a, I just can't help but think, you know, can't, you know, and you find a proper job, you know. If you want to be a musician, surely the dignity is in in writing and performing your music, not not trying to make a living out of some hackneyed performance based on other people, um, and and by trying to slavishly imitate exactly what they played on their records. Mm. You know, I have no problem with people covering a song and try and make it their own by changing the the key and the tempo and the presenting it in a way that is a little bit more original and related to the performing artist rather than just slavishly copying it. So um, that's not something I, I have a deep hatred for, but I think if you're going to do other people's music, you should try and make it your own. Uh, indeed, when people have covered Jethro Tull songs, you know, for the most part, I think, well, that's great. You know, you, at least you tried to do it your way. You didn't try to, imitate me right. um, slavishly, which I would I would not think was very clever or very interesting. Well, uh, I know this has been a question on and off over the years, but there's a, a new show in this country called Cold Cases of Rock and Roll, where they present songs that have been ripped off and the audience votes. We used to know was put up against Hotel California and the majority of people said, it's your song. Well, I think we've got to be realistic about that. You know, the chord sequence is virtually the same, but Hotel California was a great song. My song wasn't a great song. It was just an okay song. But Hotel California came sometime later, and I think uh, lyrically and in terms of its um, time signature, in terms of its uh, general mood, it's a whole different ball game. It's a, an excellent song, and I have nothing but admiration for the, the Eagles, both as songwriters and performers, to have done that material. But, you know, clearly it does have... Um, it does have a relationship, musically speaking, but, um, you know, their melody, the phrasing of the lyrics, everything is different. So I, I'm, I'm not uh, in any way going to um, denigrate the, 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 the Eagles and their creative excellence in in terms of hotel california i mean interestingly enough we are currently playing um we used to know in in the show and um and towards the end 
our guitar player, at my suggestion, deliberately um, uh, imitates the the guitar solo in Hotel California, um, which is just a little mischievous nod and a wink. Right. But of course, it's a different time signature and yeah. different key, so uh, it's. Uh, but the, you know, it would be recognisable. Just a little bit of a a naughty nod and a wink when it comes to the relationship. But uh, I think I think there are other cases, notably at the moment, Ed Sheeran, who for not the first time is embroiled in a plagiarism row. And I think it is the job of an artist to make sure that when you, you know, when you write a song before you release it into the public domain, that you do a little bit of research and make sure as far as you can that it's not uh, either in terms of title or in terms of musicality, that it is going to be uh, too close to the bone when it comes to something previously released that will embroil you in a, at the very least in in um, charges of imitation. But when it comes to the legal aspect of plagiarism, then you're in hot water. And um, been a couple of occasions where somebody has done that with one of my songs and I've chosen not to go the legal route, but, um, to seek in one case that the royalties were given to a charity of my choice mm. uh, because I felt it was quite merciless the way in which they'd ripped off something. And uh, the, by, by virtue of the fact that the, the artist concerned agreed um, unhesitatingly to do that, I guess they knew the game was up and they accepted their culpability, but you know, it's, it's the job of all of us to make sure that we, we, we do some research you know, so that would be my advice to any songwriter today. You know, it's four words. Write it, research it. And clearly, Ed Sheeran didn't... He only did the first half of that uh, commandment. Okay. Now, uh, Derek Shulman is a friend of mine. I was in touch with him recently to send my condolences. I'm sure you know his brother Ray passed away. Uh, um, yes, I, I too sent my condolences to Derek when I... And I heard that the day after it, um, after Ray's untimely passing, but Ray, Ray actually would have been working on the new Jethro Tell album as the DVD right. and Blu-ray author of the um, of the of the discs that are part of the box set. But um, I was told at the time that Ray wasn't available, and I guessed that it was to do with ill health because he'd been suffering from uh, unspecified ill health for a few years, and so um, I was. Uh, I was not surprised to hear that, but disappointed that it was um, his untimely demise was so soon. Now, for those that don't know, we're talking about the band Gentle Giant. I told uh, Derek I was going to be interviewing you in a couple of weeks, and uh, you're probably aware that he says Jethro Tull is the greatest band in progressive rock history. Well, I think he's being, a, I think he's just being a bit nice there. I mean, Derek, Derek was a, in his day, you know, a vital part, doing a very difficult job in Gentle Giant because he was um, being the front man in a band like that and, and being primarily the singer. Right. It was, um, you know, a very conspicuous role, whereas the, the obvious musicality and to some degree musical, musical excess of the other band members, they, um, Derek might have seemed a little pedantic in their wake, but uh, Derek was a very important character, and I, in fact, I, I watched a um, a YouTube video of of, uh, of Gentle Giant only yesterday, mm. um, which was um, uh, seriously made me think that Derek sang some very difficult melodies. Yes, he did. You know, they weren't they weren't things that trotted off the tongue in the usual harmonic sequences of music of that day or now. They they, they were quite difficult songs to sing, and um, I think I think he's a very un unrated, underrated musical force, whether in Gentle Giant or elsewhere. Difficult stuff to do. As to its immediate impact and how easy it was on the ear i think clearly most of the time it wasn't but that's not what gentle giant set out to do they set out to break the boundaries of uh, of what then was i suppose progressive rock music and take it on a bit further and they were they were on tour with jethro tell 
a couple of times and um they uh perhaps didn't get the recognition that was due to them because it was seen by the record company to be a little bit too clever and a little bit too uncommercial and they were under some pressure to try and write more straight ahead contemporary pop and rock songs uh, unfortunately when they did that it wasn't well received either because i guess the gentle giant fans so they were quite successful in a subculture way both in italy and to some extent in the usa they um they were seen to be selling out and so it was a bit you know they, they whatever they whatever they tried to do they couldn't win mm -hmm. and um subsequently like many other people i've said to derek you know it would be really great to you know before it's too late to 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 put gentle giant back together again and do some shows because i'm sure it would have all the impact and success of for instance king crimson who a couple of years ago made a, a re-emergence uh, only for a short period of time i have it on good authority it, it's not going to happen again but the gentle giant i thought they could they could afford to play you know just a few shows in europe maybe record something yeah. um and um make it a make it a tribute to the the memory of of the band as it was and the musicians who played in it because some of the guys still do go out and play mm -hmm. in a you know it's a sort of tribute to gentle giant um it still sort of half exists okay. but you know with the passing of ray um then uh and the the um um the other brother uh the the oldest of the brothers Phil. Sean, Phil. Yeah, Phil. yeah, Phil. He he doesn't play anymore. I spoke to him some few years ago, and he definitely had had uh, hung up his saxophone. So, um, but Derek is is just not interested. I I think I kind of understand it because I think he is. It's not that he doesn't want to do it. My gut feeling is he's afraid to do it because to go out there and try and rekindle something when you haven't performed live for many many years and you haven't um, grappled with the enormity of going out on tour and rehearsal and doing all that stuff. I think it's. I think his reticence is probably a bit of um, genuine insecurity and fear of tackling something where it could fall flat on his face. Right. Um, so uh, I understand, but it's always worth. Yeah. Just it's always worth to... saying, yeah. as, as I have done a few times. Come on, Derek. Come on. Let's let's uh, let's see Gentle Giant out there again. Okay. Just a couple more things, and I'll let you go. Uh, are you, well, I know you are because you're aware of what happens and you read a lot, but are you uh, aware of the other musicians that you have influenced like Iron Maiden and Eddie Vedder and Pearl Jam? Do you, are you aware of this? The well, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm aware of it in some cases because people have publicly said something or privately have said something to me. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of other people that I have absolutely no idea about who might count Jethro Tull as one of their many influences in music. But that's the case. You know, none of us or few of us, I think, are simply going through our lives in debt to one or two other artists. Usually there's 10 or 20 other artists that we would say were, you know, important influences in our musical careers. And, and so Jethro Tull probably figures somewhere in the the lower part of that 20 when it comes to uh, a number of other artists but yes i mean sometimes it's uh it has uh, intrigued other people and i hope with the possibility that they didn't have to assume a strictly mainstream stance musically that it gave people the courage and the the enthusiasm for doing something that was a little more a little bit more personal and off the beaten track musically that you could be successful without having to obey the perceived rules of commerciality. Okay. Just a couple of things. Uh, are you, um, you gave me a statement about 20 years ago in an interview that I have used on other people. And so I'm not going to ask you if you plan on retiring or, you know, when's the last tour or any of that, but I did ask you back then, and your answer was so spot on that I've used it when other people have, I said, well, you know what Ian Anderson says? 
he says, and I think you're probably in your, your 40s at the time, and you said, I see no reason. When I was coming up, my idols were the John Lee Hookers, the Muddy Waters. These people were in their 60s, 70s, and early 80s. So why would I ever give up? Uh, well, exactly, yes. I think that, uh, I think that um, luckily in the world of arts and entertainment, we don't have to put ages on retirement if you're a you know if you're a football player or a formula one race driver or a tennis player you know the chances are that your best days are in your mid to late 20s and that um once you enter your 30s it's getting tough and by the time you're 40 it's over um with with very few exceptions right however in arts and entertainment you know we do get to die with our boots on you know if we choose to and we're able to continue then retirement isn't really something that most of us care to think about because what we do doesn't really depend on on being in your prime of life um if you're mentally and physically capable then you tend to want to continue um and clearly the same thing applies to some politicians who at, at my age or even older still want to believe they can become prime ministers presidents and um and in your country, quite obviously, there are the two main contenders, again, are people who many would argue should be put out to the grass, who are actually playing too old to do the job and remember um, remember what it is they're supposed to say without an auto cue. Uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's a difficult one, but I, I think in, in arts and entertainment, we, we tend to get more respect than politicians who continue to the bitter end um so i am happy that i am not a politician okay well uh i did speak to a band the other day and uh they fall into the same category as you do in case you haven't heard this before you're one of the few english bands from the late 60s that's still out there playing still making albums whose lead singer is not mick jagger uh, well, I think Paul McCartney's still about, isn't he? And um, well, he doesn't have his band. And, and obviously, Roger Waters is out and about. And and of of that ilk, I even heard that the Kinks were talking, as they frequently do, about getting together and doing another tour. And they're they 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 preceded Jethro Tull by four or five years at least. So, um, you know, there are quite a few who are still alive and kicking. Um, I would have added Jeff Beck to that, except of course uh, he passed away I think long before his time but you know there's quite a few folks who have been very productive in later life and um that's uh that's good to know that, that there's there's a few people out there but we, we do tend to think perhaps unreasonably that there are only a few of us old folks left but I think if you look at the touring schedules of if you look at venues and see who's performing, you know, you, you'll see with amazing regularity names from the late 60s and early 70s uh, who are still out there doing what they do. And, um, you know, we, we all know in our hearts that this is probably, you know, the last few years that you will ever get to see many of mm. many of those artists. Right. But I guess in most cases they will be performing until weeks, months, a year or so before they finally pass away because i think it's in, instinctive in most of us that if we feel mentally and physically capable we're going to we're going to pull out the stops and and try and do a bit more before it's too late um okay you know and I mean, many of us are probably feel unreasonably that we're still um you know in great shape and and perfectly capable of doing as well or better than we ever did before. But in my case, I'm realistic. There are some things I can do better than I used to do them. There are other things I can't do as well as I used to do them. Um, but I, I try to balance it out to try and make sure that um, what I do is, is not going to be undignified um, in terms of my my ability to to go on stage and do a concert. But um, I have been compromised in in more recent years, not not in the last four or five years so much, but you know, going back seven, ten years, I've been compromised by my at that point undiagnosed lung 
disease, which happily these days is not as, as big an issue as it was uh, five years ago, well, seven years ago. So, um, you know, I'm in better shape now than I was back then, for sure. And I manage the situation better with medication. So, um, you know, at the moment, I'm no worse off than a whole bunch of other people who um, suffer from asthma and are performing artists. There's quite a few of us. Um, at least um, my more recent diagnosis was asthma rather than COPD. Um, so it is a manageable, not a curable, but a manageable disease. And uh, COPD is a slippery slope. So back in 2019, I was, um, you know, I was imagining that the end was probably coming fairly soon, but that's uh, turned out not to be the case. I'm not going to, I'm going to end on this because I'm not going to ask you about it. I've heard you talk about it and you don't care and everything, but uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame recently announced that as far as they're concerned, they're looking more towards rap and pop. And if you're Emerson, Lake and Palmer or Jethro Tull or Joe Cocker, forget it. So I'm well, involved. That, that is a huge relief to me that that, that, is, if that is emanated from the, from the, um, the heart, from the pulse of the, uh, of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame people, then phew, then I'm off the hook because I would absolutely not want to offend anybody, right. whether it was fans or indeed the organizers of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame by saying, I'm sorry, but I'm going to be washing my hair that day. I'm not able to come to wherever it is they do these things. But, you know, the point is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, first of all, it's an institution about American music. It's an institution about Americana. And whilst it may acknowledge some British artists and British bands, I think it's tended to acknowledge those that are more indebted to American music. Uh, it is, after all, the American Rock and Roll of Hall and uh, the American uh, Hall of whatever it's called, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, and I think there are a whole lot of relatively unsung heroes in American music that deserve to be in in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame long before they they might scrounge from the bottom of the barrel and say, oh, well, we'll, we'll ask Jethro Tull if they want to be inducted. Um, the answer is no, I don't, because I don't I don't feel I owe... I, I, it's not that I... I owe a great deal to American music when I was a teenager because I grew up listening to jazz and blues. But um, by the time I was in my early 20s, I really thought I... I, I, um, I would prefer to draw my musical um, influences from primarily from European music, because that's where I'm from. Mm. Um, and I don't really feel it's appropriate to, um, uh, you know, to, to lump Jethro Tull in with some of those great American bands that, that have not yet been perhaps recognised by a, particularly a younger public. So um, I, am, I am grateful if I don't face that dilemma of uh, somebody sending me a a letter or an email saying, oh, we've decided to induct Jethro Tull. And then I would have to politely explain, look, just, just, just don't, don't, don't mention it to anybody. Don't, don't say anything. I mean, I'm not going to be there. And I, I don't, I don't like awards things. I don't like attention. I just want to have a quiet life. And the only time, you know, I've been dragged into a few award things in my life. I have just been squirming with embarrassment and and feeling of of uh, being out of place i i really don't enjoy that stuff i don't um if you if you walk around my house you won't see any and it's a big house you will not see any gold albums hanging on the wall or any objets or um trophies um you know it's the it's it's the musical equivalent of having a a moose head on your walls or you know or a, or a, a elephant's head or something you shot while you were on safari i mean it's it's, a, it's obscene i absolutely have no desire to uh, to worship the idols of um of commercial success it just isn't something i have ever done and i will never do and um i, I believe i have a grammy somewhere because my son found it a few years ago when he was <laughs> writing right. about in an attic upstairs, he said, what's this, Dad? I said, oh, oh, that's the Grammy. Goodness me, I wonder, I've never seen that for many years. And he said, what shall I do with it? I said, well, just, just you know, put it back where you found it. I don't need to know. So uh, given that I've not been made aware that it's available for 
princely sum on eBay. I assume he put it back in the bottom drawer of wherever he found it in whatever disused bedroom. So, um, but it's, it's it's not with a it's not in a disparaging way. I'm eternally grateful for that recognition from peer group uh, in the case of the Grammys, but it's just not something that I choose to celebrate. So, you know, I can be grateful for being thought of in a positive way, but I don't want to revel in it. I don't want to publicly be sort of uh, dragged into that sense of, um, of trophy worship. So I, I'm just not made that way. I just like a quiet life. I, I absolutely hate attention. And if you spend as many days of your life as I have on tour performing in front of crowds, you add up all those hours of not just attention, but deep scrutiny then you possibly might understand that the rest of my time, I just want to blend into the background as some, you know, little old man shuffling around the the streets of some small city somewhere or going in a museum or a cathedral or an art gallery. And I, I just want to be anonymous. I just, I just don't like attention. Yeah. And, um, and I was like that in my twenties, you know, when I, particularly in the USA when Jethro Tull was became quite famous. You know, I just wanted to hide away. I really, really didn't like being recognized in the street or, or, or pursued with people seeking autographs or these days, of course, selfies as well. Hmm. So I, I just don't like the attention. I, I'm just a private person who likes to slip, slip into and through the crowd without without any special attention. That's why I, I use public transport a lot. And I think, you know, if you're on a train or on a bus or um, people tend not to give you a second glance. And I, I'm never, never accosted when I'm traveling around as I usually do on the train. For example, I, I travel on a train a lot. I mean, people just don't notice other people because it is a world of anonymity in public transport. And um, if you're sitting in the first class lounge in a Heathrow airport, on the other hand, people will look at you and see, you know, who is that? Why is he in here? And, but, you know, if you're on a public transport, then people just don't, don't look at you in that way. You're just part of the crowd. And I like being part of the crowd because that's where I came from. And that's where, you know, I spent much of my life as just a, another person in the crowd and i like that way of being it keeps me grounded keeps me down to earth and gives me a sense of of being no better no loftier than my fellow person in the street and that's not a misplaced kind of view it is something intrinsic to the way i feel you know that we are created equal and we die most definitely very equal you know as a either as a wisp of uh, burning ashes above the crematorium or, or as a rotting cadaver in the ground. Either way, we end up more equal than is possible to imagine. Okay. Listen, Ian, I know you got to go. I want to uh, thank you very much um, for doing this. I wish you a lot of luck with the new album. And, uh, of course, thank you. Tour. I will try and get out there and see you again, probably the 12th or 13th time I've done that. But... Uh, what can I say? You, you just you, you put on a great performance. I don't I have to tell you. I don't have to stroke you because the interview's over now. But well, I, I, have, I have to tell you, I played three or four horribly wrong notes a few nights ago when I was at a <laughs> something I've played an awful lot of times. And my brain just became disengaged as to the key and the harmonic sequence I was in. And I just played the flurry of most embarrassingly awful notes. And I I mean, it was pretty much my only mistakes in a, in the concert, but it, it was utterly embarrassing, you know, that I couldn't play something uh, without messing up. And of course, as soon as you play the first wrong note of a sequence, you then, you are rattled, you become completely um, phased and, and, and then you, your brain just goes to pieces and, Happily, I wasn't the only person that night amongst the band who made a mistake, but it, it's embarrassing when it happens. But I think in a way it's quite good that it does. And I often think secretly when I get back to my dressing room, I often think, you know, I hope some other people heard that mistake as well, just so that they know that it's not, um, number one, it's not that easy, some of the stuff we play. And number two, you know, we're all just human. We all, we all make mistakes. We all 
we all cock up. And so I tried to think in a positive way and th with the fond um, realization that I am sharing my the error of my ways with other people. <laughs> it's not always as convenient as making a mistake, you know, it, when you're singing in the shower or in rehearsal or something <laughs> in front of a lot of people. It's it's a it's a good um, a good leveler, a good um, a good bringing down to earth, which I think all of us probably benefit from in the long term. Anyway, well, nice to talk to you. And we'll I'm going to end with one soon. thing. Just yeah. what you just said. I don't think. You should worry about it, and not that you are, but and I don't think most people know this. You were the only, you were the second band behind after the Beatles to play Carnegie Hall. Well, well, no, I think it was the second band after the Beatles to play Shea Stadium. That 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 that's that is the statistic. I'm sure Carnegie Hall was not a a popular venue. Um, I wasn't actually aware that the Beatles had played there, but Carnegie Hall, I know when we played there the first time, it was something that um, was um, was a little tricky because they weren't used to having people from my side of the musical um, sphere in the uh, in the hallowed halls of that classical tradition. So, um, you know, there have been a few places where we have been amongst the very few to have been allowed to play in certain venues. I'm thinking of a couple of magnificent historical amphitheaters on the shores of the Mediterranean that um, have been, uh, you know, I've been very honoured to be allowed to play there. Um, and part of the reason I feel honoured isn't just because it's me playing there. I'm honoured because the audience of Jethro Tull is considered to be mature enough and respectful enough to be able to come in and watch a show. So in a way, it's it's not just a feather in my hat, it's a feather in the hat of our fans who are seen to be acceptable in, in venues that are normally reserved for opera or classical artists, or in some cases, no artists at all, because they are historical sites that are not really very often open for entertainment purposes. But um, they mean a lot to me. And um, Shea Stadium is, you know, it's an interesting place to do a gig, but not one that I think I'd be... Um, rating very highly in terms of either satisfaction for the artist or for the audience. Right. So um, if you get the chance, if you see Jethro Tull on it, uh, uh, the amphitheater in Ephesus in Turkey or in the, or in the uh, uh, Atticus uh, Herodes in, uh, in, uh, in Athens, then bowl up and enjoy the show. But if you see Jethro Tull advertised in Shea Stadium, I should give it a miss. Okay. Once again, thank you very much, Ian. We'll see you on tour. Good luck with the new album. I understand it's already charted. And uh, you're just always a great interview. So next album, next tour, I'll be back again for another chat. Thank Brilliant. you. Very thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you. And thank you for all the compliments. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. That's my conversation with Jethro Tull's Ian Anderson. Always a pleasure to speak with him. And I hope you enjoyed it. By the way, The Rock Podcast is now the number one podcast for classic rock, and I thank you for listening. Tell your friends we're available on all the usual platforms, wherever you get your podcasts. We have a video version on YouTube as well. You can also sign up to our channel, and you'll be notified when a new episode is released. And of course, it's free, no charge, just a lot of rock and roll stories. You can check out the previous episodes with John Anderson, The Doors, Billy Gibbons, The Zombies, Nancy Wilson, uh, Led Zeppelin, Bruce Springsteen, Pink Floyd, Kate Bush, a whole bunch of great stuff. We feature new interviews as well as classic conversation from my archives. Find us at the website, therockpodcast.com, and on Facebook. And you can send your comments, questions, suggestions. Contact me at hello at therockpodcast.com. That's hello at therockpodcast.com. I love hearing from you. Till next time, I'm Denny Somak, and that's it for now.